Good evening, everybody, and welcome to What's the Buzz, the fifth in our series of European Beef webinars. Um, tonight, uh, local bee expert Liz Gavitt is going to take us on a visual tour of the Corbury Road Meadow, which is one of the areas in Limerick City which is being managed by the Limerick City and County Council's Parks Department. Um, in a way that allows it to provide food and habitat for pollinators. And Liz is also going to introduce um, an e-learning tool which uh, helps identify six of the most common bumblebees in Ireland. So over to you, Liz. Okay. Hi, everyone. And thank you very much, Anne, for that introduction. Um, and thank you to everyone for joining on a Thursday evening at 8 o'clock. I appreciate your support. Um, first, just a little bit of a background about me. I am a local Limerick woman. I am from a dairy farm. I grew up in a dairy farm just outside Limerick City, but I've always had a love for nature. And so much so that when I went to college, I studied zoology in Aberdeen. But it's only recently that I've begun using my scientific background in a professional capacity. These days, I'm the project officer with the Maid Rivers Trust. So, I'm also an active citizen scientist. And for the past number of years, I have been recording bats with Bat Conservation Ireland, and my garden birds with Birdwatch Ireland. And since 2014, I've been recording bumblebees and flowers with the National Biodiversity Data Centre. And while Anne might have described me as a bee expert, I'm not really. I'm more an enthusiast. I've got very good at identifying bumblebees, but I'm learning the whole time. And what I would encourage anyone listening today is to become a citizen scientist because there's so much to gain from it. And um, it really opens up your eyes to the natural world around us. So my talk tonight, as Anne said, is going to be divided into two sections. First, I'm going to give you a tour of Corbally Road Meadow. Um, I've been taking the photos that you're about to see for the past couple of months, and then that'll take around 20 minutes. And then the second part of the part, uh, from my talk tonight is about an e-learning course that I developed called What's That Buzz? So before I show you or the tour of the Corby Meadows, I want to explain about pollinating insects and the flowers. Flowers and insects have evolved together and they need each other. Flowers provide the nectar, the food source for the insects, and in return, the insects help the flower reproduce by transferring pollen, the male part of the flower, to another flower when they fly from one to another. When the pollen drops off their body, it lands on the female part of another flower, and that begins the reproductive cycle of flowers and eventually produces a seed. But when people think of pollinators, often they just think of bees. But there's a lot more than that. In Ireland, we have 99 species of bees, and only one of them is the honeybee, and they're the only ones to produce honey. But we have 98 other species of bumblebees and solitary bees. And they're brilliant pollinators. But there's other pollinator insects, and these are hoverflies, wasps, sawflies, beetles, butterflies, and ordinary flies. They're all pollinating insects too because they all help in the whole pollination process. You're going to see an awful lot of beautiful flowers, and what I have found really useful is Zoe Devlin's book called Wildflowers of Ireland. It's incredibly user-friendly. What she has done is she has grouped the flowers according to their color. So you can look up whether it's a purple, pink, yellow, white or green flower. And then she has subdivided those groups according to the number of petals. So all you have to do is count the petals on a flower. And you can buy this book but you can also use her website called wildflowersofireland.net. It's incredibly easy and it's free once you have Wi-Fi. Um, so most of us have smartphones these days. So when you take a picture, you can examine it in detail afterwards. 
I would ask that people don't pick wildflowers uh, because it's much better just to leave them grow. And most days, these days, most people don't pick flowers anyway, they just leave it to nature. So where is Corbley Road Meadow? Well, Corbley Road Meadow is on the north side of Limerick City. When you cross over the Abbey River and you go via O'Dwyer's Bridge, Corbley Road Meadow is immediately on your left. It's around a hectare site and Limerick City and County Council have been managing it for the past number of years. And it is amazing. And I would encourage anyone to go visit it. And also since 2018, um, Dr. Tom Harrington, a botanist, has been recording all the plants there. And he has recorded over 122 species, which is absolutely brilliant for biodiversity. Because with such a wide variety of flower, flowers, they all bloom at different times of the year. So from early spring, when we have all our dandelions, to late autumn, in this patch, in the city, you have lots of blooming flowers, which is brilliant for all the insects that depend on it. So here's the tour. So in this picture, what you see is an early bumblebee, and it's so-called the early bumblebee because it's the first to emerge from hibernation. And that's red clover that she's feeding on. And by the way, it's fair to assume most bees are female because the majority of them are. And they're the ones out doing the work, gathering the nectar and pollen and bringing it back to the nest. But red clover is found all over Ireland and it blooms early throughout the year. And the little yellow flower in the background is called Black Medic, and it's a member of the pea family, as is clover. Here you have a picture of bush fetch and the common carder bee. Bush fetch starts blooming in April, May time, and it's a fantastic flower for pollinators. Pollinators love the color purple and they're quite attracted to it. So these flowers have evolved to you know, attract the insect in. Here we have bird's foot trefoil, a really bright yellow flower, and that's a red-tailed bumblebee going in for some nectar. And if you look carefully under her beating wing, you can see a little pellet of pollen. And when you go into Corbley Rug Meadow, there's loads of patches of birds for trefoil all over the place. Um, it's really quite beautiful. It's so bright. Here we have an oxide daisy, and that's a sawfly on it. Now, there's loads of sawflies in Ireland. There's actually, I think, around 235 species of sawflies in Ireland. And they're pollinators too, because if you're looking at that, insect there, I hope you can see it, it's covered in pollen. And here's another sawfly species, and it's on common vetch. So it's the same, belongs to the same family as the bush vetch, but this one is a more cerise pink, and if you think it looks like sweet pea, you're right, because they're all a member of the pea family. And this is meadow vetchling. It blooms later in the season. I noticed it in June this year. And here we have another sawfly. And the sawfly here, if you, I hope you can see it, but it's antennae. They're long and they've also got more hairs in it, which are what they use for sensing the environment around them. And the flower this um, sawfly is on is actually wild carrot. I just took this picture last week. Here we have meadow buttercup. Corbley Meadow is full of buttercups. And sometimes people think that it's not great for insects, but from my observations, I've, I've always seen insects on them. And what we have here is a hoverfly. But I've also seen spiders and small little beetles all resting on the buttercups. Here we have another oxide daisy, and that's a hoverfly too. 
There's lots of hoverflies in Ireland. There's actually around 180 species. And they all vary. Because that's another hoverfly too. So it's quite different to the previous two you've seen. And here it is on buttercup. And this is another hoverfly, which looks completely different to the ones previously. And it's just perched on some hawthorn. And what you might think about this hoverfly that we're looking at here, that it's quite furry and it looks like a bee. Well, it's actually mimicking a bee. And how you tell a hoverfly from a bumblebee is you look at the antennae. Hoverflies have small little butty antennae. Um, their eyes are quite big and googly. They're on the front of their heads. And they have single wings. Whereas when you look at a bumblebee, they've got long antennae and their legs are quite modified and they're built for carrying pollen. And also, it's, it's a bit hard to see in this picture of the bumblebee, but they have a, a narrow waist, like a wasp waist. And also, bees have double wings, whereas a hoverfly has just single wings. A couple of weeks ago, Rachel Bain from the Don't Mow, Let It Grow project was giving a talk. And she talked about yellow rattle. Well, we have yellow rattle in Corby Road Meadow too. And this is what it looks like. And yellow rattle is a semi-parasitic plant. And it's really good for meadows because it suppresses the grass from taking over. In meadows, grass will become the dominant um, plant if let be. So what yellow rattle is really good is because it's semi-parasitic, it actually binds to the roots of grass and it takes the nutrients so it just gives the other plants a chance to compete for light and for nutrients. This really bright blue flower is chicory and it's in bloom in the meadow at the moment. It's not actually a native plant, it's considered a garden escapee according to Zoe's book and that's another type of hoverfly perched in it there. And here we have tufted vetch. What I've noticed this year is that tufted vetch um, blooms around a month after bush vetch. And you can see it looks different. It's all the blooms fall to one side of the stem. And it is a nice balayage of pink and purples, if you want to describe it in hair terms. But it's very pretty. And again, it's great for pollinators. Here we have white clover. White clover is so important for our pollinators because it's found all over the country and it grows in a lot of our lawns if we don't cut it. So white clover, um, the thing is to let it be there and uh, let it bloom. And maybe if you have to cut your lawn, just cut it every six weeks and let clover come up and bloom for the insects to be done. There's also a patch of bladder campion in the meadow, which I was surprised to find, but it's really pretty. I would also say that Corby Road Meadow, if you're into photography, it's a great place to go because there's so much color and variety. And here we have Lady's Bed Straw. Lady's Bed Straw is the most wonderfully scented plant you can find. It's in bloom at the moment in the meadow. Um, I've only seen it in the past couple of weeks. And what I've noticed about the meadow is that it's, um, it's almost an assault in the sense of the senses because you have so much traffic passing. But if you just take a moment and just breathe in the sense, you can smell the different flowers. But at the moment, Lady's Bed Straw is quite strong. And Lady's Bed Straw gets its name from what it was used for. In days gone by, um, mattresses were made from horse hair or straw. And what people used to do is they'd pick the ladies' bed straw, the yellow plant, and stuff it into their mattresses. So you'd go to sleep in heavenly scented bed, but it was also supposed to be good for repelling fleas. So, you know, twofold um, reasons for putting it into your mattress. 
At the moment, cell peel is also in bloom. It's quite a low growing plant on, near the ground, but it's great for pollinators. And here we have knapweed. Knapweed is really coming into its own at the moment. And that's a red tailed bumblebee, and it's a male one. So I love the color, it really stands out. And what's nice about knapweed and other thistle like um, plants is the if you want to photograph an insect they can fly away off it so quickly so you get an extra half a second to take the photograph so and also the contrast is great now I know this might be a pretty ragged looking dandelion but they are so important and if you can see the center of the dandelions there you see lots of tendrils that are covered in pollen and that's actually a solitary bee that's getting tucked in to the nectar there but dandelions are so important because they're one of the first flowers to bloom in large quantities in um, early spring and I'm going to go through the life cycle of the bumblebee in a few slides time, but dandelions cannot be underestimated for their importance in the survival of all pollinating insects coming into the year. So now I'm going to just show you some of the butterflies that are found in the meadow. And there's two great websites that you can use um, to help you identify the different species. One is called irishbutterflies.com and the other is butterfly conservation. But because we don't have so many butterflies in Ireland, it's one of the features of being an island. Um, I think we've only got around 33 species of butterflies and it's quite easy to, well, if you're lucky to get a picture of a butterfly, but if, when you do is compare what you've taken to the lists on the images that are on these websites. So here we have cat's ear, that's the name of the yellow flower there, and that's a dinghy skipper. I took that picture quite early in the year, that was taken around April. And I finally got a picture of a common blue um, last weekend in the meadow. There's lots of common blues in the meadow. It's just really difficult to get a picture of them. And that common blue is perched on some white clover. And this plant is called Ragged Robin, and you can see why, because it looks a bit ragged. And that's a wood white butterfly having some nectar. This isn't actually a butterfly. This is a six spotted burnet, and it's a daytime flying moth. And I got quite excited to see it when I did, because it's not that it's not found in Limerick, it is. It's just not as common as you might see further west in coastal areas which is quite, quite fabulous and fashionable. And here we have some creeping thistle. Creeping thistle is all over the countryside at the moment, and that is a small tortoise shell. Here, more creeping thistle, and that's a meadow brown. And I took all these photos of butterflies by the bean sweeper in the past few weeks. And here we have bramble. Bramble is so important to Irish pollinators and all insects because it's one of our most widespread. And if you're interest, getting interested in insects, I would say go to anywhere where there's bramble because you're always going to find insects there. It supports huge numbers of species. And this is what becomes the blackberries that uh, we will eventually pick in September time. But um, in Corby Road Meadow, it's lining the pond area, the wetland. Here we have some purple loosestrife. I only found one clump of it in the meadow, but it's very common as well along rivers and lakes. And at the moment, there's a lot of white flowers in bloom in the meadow. So you can see wild carrot there and how you can tell wild carrot from other similar white 
shaped flowers is it always has this tiny little red flower in the middle. And when you put it beside other plants like yarrow, you can see the difference. But at a just but when you're looking at things at a distance, you think, oh, they're all the same, but they're not. But when you compare them close up, you can see the difference. And on the white yarrow, the far right one, there's another type of hoverfly. So there's a huge amount of variety of hoverflies in the meadow. And this is a close-up of the little red flower that's, um, that you get on the carrot flower head. And the red beetle to the side is called a red soldier beetle, also called bonking beetles, because when they arrive in Ireland, they start getting down to business really quickly. And here is some more bush vet, and that's the seven spotted ladybird. How you identify ladybirds is you literally count the spots. Now, I haven't seen as many this year as other years, but this is a picture from the meadow. So now on to the second part of my talk, and I'm going to talk about the common Irish bumblebees. So we have six species that are very common. And the National Biodiversity Centre has created a citizen science project called the All-Ireland Bumblebee Monitoring Scheme. And I've been part of this since 2014. Um, what it involved was um, one day, Dr. Una Fitzpatrick came down and she gave a workshop. And it's to train people to become recorders according to a specific method and to do a one kilometer walk and record the bumblebees they find once a month. And I, had a, I loved it, I love bees. But at the end of the course, I was a little bit overwhelmed by all the information that I've been given. And I figured there needs to be another support there for people who want to become recorders or active citizen scientists. So last year I was doing my master's in tech communication and e-learning, and I had to create an assignment um, for people. And I decided I would create an online course that would complement the workshop. And it was about, it was for active citizen scientists and how to record the most common Irish bumblebees. I had considered how teaching people how to identify the 21 species, but a very good friend of mine, John Green, said, focus on the six most common ones, do that well. And when people see a rare herb bumblebee, they'll know what's different to the common ones. And if they've stuck with, they know they're common bumblebees, um, well, they'll usually have, by their own interest, learned a bit more and looked at other resources to find out what are the rare ones. But the course is freely available online through the kind support of Limerick City and County Council and the European Green Leaf Award. And what we did is when I had handed in the assignment for my master's to make it suitable for public use, it needed to be finalized. And with Limerick support and the um, Green Leaf um, support, it is now freely available to anyone, anywhere in the world, through the Limerick.ie website and the National Biodiversity Centre. And the course might seem a little bit long, but it's designed that you can go in and out at any time to learn or revise different sections. What I've done is I've described the life cycle of the bumblebee, because it's different to what you might think honeybees are. And if you know what to expect at different times of the year, it makes it a little bit easier to keep an eye out for different species or different features. I'll just go through the life cycle in brief. The queen is the only member of the nest to survive winter. She goes into hibernation. She goes into a little hole in the ground and she stays there until early spring. And when she comes out in early spring, she needs those dandelions to survive because she has to replenish her body and build up strength. So often what you find in early spring is you see lots of quite big bumblebees 
flying low to the grass. But what they're doing is they're looking for a nest. And she, sorry, to refer to her as, 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 her, as her title, the queen, she is looking for a nest. And nests are often little old, disused rodent nests that she will take over because they're usually in a dry spot, they're fur lined, and they're nice and warm. So she'll go into a nest and she'll provision it with nectar and pollen that she's collected, and then she'll start laying eggs. And her first brood will be workers, who she then sends out to um, bring in nectar and pollen for their siblings as she continues to lay more eggs. And that continues through late spring and summer. And then as the summer goes on, she begins to lay male bumblebees. And they'll be picked out of the nest once they're strong enough, and they'll go and hunt for new queens. And what the queen will, then will do after she's laid the males, she'll then lay eggs that become queens. And they're the uh, members of the nest that will be go and form the next generation. So males go off and find another nest. They don't um, mate with their siblings. And the males have longer antennae for detecting queens. So when a queen emerges from a nest for the first time, there's usually males waiting for her. And they quickly get down to business, copulate, and the males are done. And what the queen, the new queens have to do then is they have to build up their um, reserves by you know, gathering lots of nectar and pollen from the flowers that are in bloom at the time. But the rest of the nest actually dies and it's only the new queen that will survive through the winter when she's in hibernation. So that's pretty much the life cycle. But if you know the life cycle of bumblebees, you know what to expect to see at different times of the year. It's also important to know the different body parts, because if you can describe the bumblebee's body parts, you can describe how it looks, and then you can match up to the appearance accord and then define the species. Like most things in nature, the males and the females are a bit different. And what you can un what you can take from bumblebees that the male bumblebees are a bit like male human males. They are extra hairy. They got hairy legs. They got facial hair. They got longer antennae for detecting queens, and they look after themselves. They don't look after the nests. It's only the females, the queens, and the workers that gather pollen for the nest. One of the unique features of the course that I have, the e-learning course, is it's got this little game. It's like a jigsaw, where you learn, where you have to assemble a bumblebee according to the stripes and how they appear, and you get feedback at all at stages, so you know if you're going right or wrong, and you're told why. So it's um, from feedback from the people who've already used it, they found this the most useful feature for learning how to identify the different species. There's also a quiz, and a quiz isn't there to criticize you, it's there to help you, because often when you get things wrong and then you go back and you find out why, it's a really good learning experience. But this is just to help you get confidence in your bumblebee identification. I've also put in some information about the rarer bumblebees. These aren't common which is very unfortunate. This beautiful picture here is the great yellow bumblebee. And it was taken by Dr. Don Breen. And it used to be found in more parts of Ireland, but in the past five years, it's only been found in the Belmullet Peninsula. And this is because it's really sensitive to fertilizers and pesticides and herbicides. It doesn't like it. So, the further west you go in Ireland, basically, the more, the less intensive agriculture or the less intensely treated gardens. But that's the distribution of the great yellow bumblebee for the past five years in Ireland. Pretty sad. We also have another bee that's becoming incredibly rare, and this is the shrill carter bee. And this picture was taken by Leon van der Nall. And it's in the course. Now, it is found in the Burren, 
and it has been found in Limerick, in Ahanish, and Askeaton, which is actually an extension of the burn, but I have yet to see it. And it's called a shrill carter bee because it actually makes a shrill sound. So we're coming towards the end here now. This is another picture of the meadow and this was just taken two weeks ago and you can see all the colours. The colours of the Irish countryside are actually pinks, purples, yellows, whites, greens. And to have a meadow like Corbury Road Meadow in Limerick City is very special. And it's a great example of where what we have and what we should appreciate. And we need meadows like this for pollinators to survive. And we, it's not great for them to be just isolated. We need a whole continuum throughout the countryside. So it's important to leave little sections of our gardens go wild, not to spray everything and to appreciate, you know, the beauty of the flowers. Some people might look at ragworth and think, oh, it's a noxious weed. And it is in certain cases, like you don't want it to die and for animals to eat it, but it's actually so important for so many other insects that if it's not causing a problem, just leave it be. And this is just a closer, um, a closer view down closer to the ground. And you can see all the different clovers. There's white, there's pink, there's buttercups coming up through there. And then we've all the grasses and we also have thistles. And then the chicory and the, you know, the remains of the oxide daisies, they're all important in the cycle because when the insects like butterflies are laying their eggs, they need these plants for the next generation to survive. So it's, it's important not just to cut things when they have gone, um, when they their life cycle is over, because you never know what else is depending on it. So that's my talk. Thank you very much for listening to me. And if you have any questions, I'll do my best to answer them. And if I don't know the answer, I'll point you in the direction where you can find the answer. Great. Thanks very much, Liz. That was wonderful. Um, fantastic photographs. Um, we have quite a few questions. Um, one here is um, from Carl, and he wants to know why bees won't use his bee hotel. How long has he had his bee hotel? Because what I've heard from people is sometimes you have to leave it there a year or so, and um, it needs to be get a bit weathered. And also, bee hotels are often better if they're smaller rather than larger because um, bee hotels, they, um, it'll be up to the bees. And um, from, I'm on, a, I'm on a Facebook group called Insects and Invertebrates of Ireland. And the experience from them is that small bee hotels tend to work better, but you just have to be patient. And, but also make sure it doesn't get wet because if it becomes, um, it becomes a bit fungus, fungusy, um, that's not a healthy habitat for, for bee hotels. Liz, just on that, um, would you talk a bit about the difference between a bee hotel and a bee scrape or a bee bank and just the different types of bees that might use the different ones? Okay, so um, a bee scrape is basically uh, what I have seen is basically a section in a farm that um, the soil has been pulled away and it's just the bare soil. And it's great for solitary bees because in, um, bees actually like um, dry south facing um, areas to build their nests. Because solitary bees will actually, so they don't live for very long, the different species, but they'll create a little hole in the, in the earth and they'll provision it with um, with the, with with uh, food for their for the, for the 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 females will lay the eggs, but um, the there's only very small few bees that will actually use a bee hotel. Most bees prefer soil as their habitat, and um, I know from 
it's actually just from um, actually farmers New her farming for biodiversity. It's one of the things that they would actually have is that have a bee scape that would encourage bees, solitary bees to nest there. So does that answer your question? Yeah, great. Thanks, Liz. And from Carl again, I have a small grey black bee that makes holes in the gaps in my Cabalock patio. Do you know what it might be? A grey black bee? Um, be a well, a bee. There's, a, there's actually mining bees, but they prefer so, um, you know, so, um, soil to make their nests. I'm not too sure. Um, at the moment, some of the bees may appear grey black. Um, but that's because they become faded in the sun. So I'm not too sure. As I said, there's there's actually 90, or sorry, there's actually 77 types of solitary bees. Um, not too sure. Um, Another picture. Maybe yeah, maybe a picture and send it on to the National Biodiversity Data Centre. Yeah. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see. Um, here's one I suppose for us. Can we encourage the council and farmers not to put verges? And that's from Carl as well. It's a really good question, Carl, and I hope so is the answer. Um, in the city, we have left areas on cut this year. Um, we did a small amount last year. We've done more this year, and hopefully we'll extend it further next year. Um, we're particularly hoping to work with residents associations to identify areas where they would like their grass managed differently and to look at some of the parks as well. But yeah, on, there's, there's a big issue with unnecessary cutting in the countryside. And I think an awful lot of it is lack of awareness and this idea that meat is better. And we just need to change that perception um, and get people to appreciate what Liz has pointed out, the kind of subtle beauty of our wildflowers. Um, so yeah, Carl, I hope we can encourage the council and farmers not to cook verges so much. Um, here's a question from Maura. Any information on the medicinal properties of some of the common wildflowers and plants we see all around us, please? Where oh yeah. That, I wonder. <laughs> um, I don't have any information and also it's something that you have to be really careful about because um, you also don't know what has been sprayed. So when you're going and looking at plants and there's a lot of plants that are edible, you need to know how it's been managed um, before you would actually ever pick it. Um, there are some websites or some Facebook groups that can give advice but I know for one of the groups that I'm a member of, um, Plants of Ireland, the administrator specifically asked people not to give medicinal information because it's not verified and you have to be very careful on the information you give out. But I think there are courses run by Seed Savers and Valley Malou who you know, do give courses on what, what you can forage for, but I unfortunately I don't know. I don't have nothing. I think that might be all the questions we have for tonight. Oh, hang on. Uh, we've got a comment here from Peter. Communication is most important to advise the public on why grass management practice is changing. And that's a very good point. Um, I think if you are, if the council is going to change its practices, it has to make sure that people understand that we're not just being lazy or trying to save money, that there's actually a reason why we're not cutting bridges. And for us as well, it's a learning process. We've learned so much from the last two years of not cutting about the problems that it can cause as well as the benefits of doing it. So um, it's, it's an evolving situation as they say. Um, so I think that's all of the questions. Um, thank you all very much for tuning in tonight and thanks to Liz for a wonderful presentation. Um, I think we'll all be rushing off to see the meadow as soon as we can. But, Good night, everybody, and hopefully we'll see you back for our next webinar. Thanks, Anne.